Amen. Thank you to the band for that prelude. And also thank you to the Virtue Boys for the piano prelude this morning as we come into worship together. Just before we share in singing a carol, we're going to uh, share in a responsive reading, a call to worship. Um, The Christmas story is a destination story. It's about an amazing journey that changed everything. It's a story about a place left and a place guaranteed. Only God could write this amazing story of the two destinations of grace. If Jesus hadn't been willing to make earth his destination, we would have no hope whatsoever of the new heavens and the new earth being our final destination. Today, our Christmas theme is incarnation. Consider how Paul summarized the Christmas story. And I'm going to invite you to now to share in the responsive reading. It's uh, the women first and then followed by the men. So let's begin. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Did not consider equality of God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Amen. And at this time, we're going to share in singing, familiar carol, Joy to the World. I'll invite you to stand together as we share in singing, and we'll sing verses 1 and 2, please. of the uh, familiar third verse says, he rules the world with truth and grace. Isn't that a wonderful promise to come to worship with today, Uh, that he rules the world with truth and grace, even though sometimes our world seems crazy, doesn't it? Uh, But we have the confidence that he rules the world with truth and grace. We're going to sing the third verse, and then um, Laura and her family are going to come and uh, light the Advent reading, do the Advent reading for us today. Third verse. simple present girl was looking forward to the greatest day of her life so far her wedding day then without warning without preparation she was looking directly into the eyes of an angel what news did Gabriel bring greetings you are high who are ah sorry um greetings you who are highly favored the Lord is with you 
And then Gabriel shared the most amazing information of all. The Holy Spirit of God would bring about the birth of a child who was his own son. This would happen even while Mary remained a virgin. And how did she respond? In an act of complete yielding, she knelt and said, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And so the greatest miracle of all began. Mary was favored by God for a task that would finally allow all each of us to be favored. Gabriel said, the Lord is with you. As a result, the Lord is with us all. In that way, God sent the ultimate Christmas gift, not just to Mary, but all of us. On this third Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of joy. May we respond as Mary did. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Holy is his name. Lord, we cannot comprehend that you, the creator of the universe, took on flesh and were born of a peasant girl. You, the one who spoke galaxies into existence, became a speechless newborn baby. You, the one who gave the stars their light, veiled your own glory and slipped unnoticed into the human race. The miracle of your incarnation is all too unexpected, too mysterious, too holy for us to understand. In expectation and joy, we worship you now and each day until Jesus returns to claim his own. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Everybody please rise.
Oh, 
Please be seated. The opportunity afforded us each and every time we gathered to fellowship one with another, to cordon off space and all those other important things to come to that which is important in this space, in this time, recognizing the God who has come to us and he shall reign forevermore. This morning, as we quiet in our hearts, I want to thank the worship team and the band for already leading us into allowing us to prepare this sanctuary that we have built with our praise this morning. And in the, this cordon space of praise and thanksgiving, to be able to make our requests known to God. Let us pray. Father, we recognize that as we come before you, Father, that as we quieten our heart, as we gaze upon the mystery that is God with us, Father, we recognize that our words are but a very rickety vehicle to be able to express our thanksgiving to you. Father, for the opportunity that is ours to gather as people of faith, Father, to gather here as your children, family of God, Father, we thank you for um, this place. We thank you, Father, for this place that has been set aside here, Father, sacred space where we might dwell in sacred time before a holy God. And Father, even though our words, Father, fail us, Father, read our spirit. By your spirit, you know our spirit. And so, Father, this day we come to you asking you, Father, that you would indeed interpret the desires of our hearts this day. Father, we thank you for words that we get to speak to one another, words of life and hope, words of encouragement and correction, words, Father, that lead us into life, full life. And Father, may we continue to express those words to each other, and to your world. Father, this day we've come and we have shared in these words, in song and in praise and in readings. And Father, they bring us to the one who is the word himself. The word writ large at this time of year. The word writ large upon all of creation. And Father, this day, this word becomes flesh here. You have made yourself known to us and you promised that you would never leave and you would never forsake. Father, this day, Father, this season, Father, we ask for your grace for each and every one of us. Father, that we could continue, Father, to know how to be your children in your world. That we might continue, Father, to be able to have opportunity to express grace to one another to show compassion, Father, to those who have been pushed aside to the margins. Father, to have empathy with one another. Father, we recognize there are so many heartbreaks in your world, and we know that these things break your heart too. Well, Father, may they break ours and drive us again to seek your face Drive us again, Father, to recognize that you alone have the words of life. And, Father, that we would be given them, that your world would hear them. Father, this day, Father, as we come, we express the joy that is within us, knowing that we have such a Savior who reigns forevermore. And, Father, we come this day with the joy that is ours to know, Father, that you have come to us in Christ to take away the sins of the world. Father, we thank you this day that we can come to this place and again express the joy in our hearts, Father, to know that we have such a fellowship with you, 
O oh, weak and human though we are, yet you have called us to be companions with the Christ in the showing forth of your kingdom. May it be so this day. Father, around our community, we give thanks for all of those other churches, all of those other hearts that are turned towards you this day. Father, may you continue to minister your grace to them and through them to your world. And Father, for those whom this season continues to weigh heavy and a discouragement for them, Father, we ask that your ministering spirit and that by your people that we would intercept their world with words of hope and encouragement, with words, Father, of life, that they would know that you have not forgotten them, but that you have come to them and that you reign forevermore. Guide us in our worship. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, just before we have our usher come with the offering, I just have a few announcements I'd like to share. Um, Amanda is not able to be here today for the kettle sign-up, but if you could just let her know your availability for this week, um, you can email her or text her or phone her uh, with that. That would be wonderful, just to let her know. And I'm sure that she'll also be posting as she has uh, the, the positions, the shifts that are available for the kettles. We just want to thank you. We've uh, been doing very well. Thank you for all those that have been supporting and helping uh, with the kettle campaign for this year. And uh, just, what, two more weeks, I think? <laughs> um, also, this, this is happening this week. The carpet cleaning will be happening tomorrow, so we'll be removing everything out of the fellowship room uh, today following our fellowship time. So if we could get some help with that as well. Also, I announced last week about um, getting the new pictures taken for our family tree out there. Uh, and there is a sign-up sheet. Darlene has put a sign-up sheet out there. So if you would like to have your uh, family picture taken, uh, you can put your name down on the sheet out there. And also the Christmas dinner next week. Last opportunity. So if you'd like to sign up for that, there's a sign-up sheet on the foyer as well. And uh, thank you to the McTaggarts and all those that are helping to put that Christmas dinner together. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful time in sharing around the table together. So let's pray. And uh, then we're going to share in a singing a chorus, an old chorus, deep and wide. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, for this day. We thank you for your love. And we thank you now for this offering that has been given, um, the tithes and offering. And we just pray your blessing. I thank you for each one that gives uh, so faithfully. And we pray that you'll continue to bless us. And as uh, this time of year, as we're doing the kettles, I just pray that you'll be with everyone that's involved there and that you'll just uh, um, be with us as we share with community and that you will give us opportunities to share your love with other people. So we give you thanks and we pray that in a few moments that as the children go to Sunday school that you'll be with them, that you'll be with their teachers, and that they will learn um, more about living their lives for you. So we give you thanks and we pray this in your name. Amen. So we're going to share that, share and singing that course, deep and wide. Maybe you. No, oh, oh. uh, Anne Margaret. Yep. <laughs> you're the reason we canceled it the other Sunday. <laughs> so you're here. It's Cindy's fault. It's Cindy's fault. Apparently. She didn't tell you that I asked. Yeah, yeah. See, it was a miscommunication. And I expect you to do the uh, uh, actions. A communication thing, right? <laughs> okay, you guys take it away. Yes, stand up for this.
Amen. Christian calisthenics. <laughs> Scripture reading. Reading from John's Gospel, chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Down to verse 10. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we pause before you to give you thanks. Father, we thank you that you continue to minister grace to us and that there is such a fountain of your love that we have never plumbed the depths of, we have never reached the end of. And Father, we thank you that that love abounds to us, abounds to your world, poured out in your Son. Father, we ask now that as we consider your word, as you by your Spirit minister amongst us, Father, that you would indeed interpret yourself to us by your spirit, again, become Emmanuel. Make your presence known. Father, and now I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would indeed be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week, uh, I, had a, I had a day off, which was really good until payday came. <laughs> Got docked for that. <laughs> but uh, Peter was on last week, and he made, the, um, he, he made an illustration, and he apologized for it. He said, it's a bit dated. Remember that? Mr. Bean. That was 1990s. And if you notice me, I was sitting right there, and I blushed a little. Because just a few weeks before that, I used one about Doris Day from 1955. (laughs) But the illustration, like I said, the illustration, today I'm going to use another illustration, and it's a bit dated. Goes back, actually is a contemporary of Mr. Bean. Goes back to the 90s. Some of you will remember this song. Uh, it's a song that, was, that came out. Uh, Joan Osborne, I think, was the first to release it. And it's entitled, What If God Was One of Us? Anybody hear that? What? Just a slob like one of us? Just a stranger on a bus trying to make his way home? What if God was one of... I remember when that came out, it didn't get played a lot in the worship teams in the evangelical churches. Blasphemy, they said, blasphemy. What if God was one of us? Blasphemy. Do you know something? It was blasphemy in John's day too. 
Everybody would have been with that whole argument that John puts forward right up to the point where he said, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And people would have got up and started leaving. I don't believe in any of that. That God in all of the universe, the high, the unknowable, the all-knowing one, that He can come and be with us. Don't believe that. You've gone too far now. But that's who we serve. The God who goes too far. He goes too far for us. He has come to us. And so what if God was one of us? Blasphemy? Yes. It was blasphemous then. It is blasphemy now. To think that that could ever be. Because nobody had conceived that happening. That was something outside the realm of possibility. And yet the sentiment holds for us. It informs our response. If we, if we stay with it, if we, if we don't throw it out right after you all hear it and all it's gone, if you just consider the question, what if God was one of us? You see, uh, that word that we hear today, that word that we're using today, that word that draws us today is incarnation. That the word has become one of us. What does the Hebrew says? Likened in every way to us. Like us, holy and truly human. What if God was one of us? Indeed, this whole idea, this, this incarnation is the very foundation of our faith. This is why we make the profession that we do, that God in Christ has come to us. What? To save His people. That's why He's come. That's the very foundation of the faith that we profess, that God became one of us. God became one of us. He has come, flesh and bone, and made made Himself known to us, the divine one, becomes the human one. Actually, in Mark's gospel, that's the only reference that Christ receives for himself. That's the way that he acknowledges. He speaks of himself as the human one. The human one. So why did he come? What's the purpose of this incarnation? The purpose of his coming? You say, well, we were talking about, well, he came to die. Well, yes, maybe. But that's not exceptional. We don't get out of this world alive. He came to die. Oh yeah, but he came to die as a criminal. That too is not exceptional. A lot of criminals die. Yes, but he was innocent. That's not exceptional either. A lot of innocent people will die this very day. That's not exceptional. Christ suffered. Oh, the suffering of the world today. People suffer today. That's not unusual, sad to say. But why is it? What is it that Christ is attempting to do? Christ in coming, God in sending His Son to come, the incarnation, what is it to show us? Is it to show us what God is like? Maybe. Maybe we catch glimpses of that there. Maybe we catch something in Christ. But did he have to become human to show us what the divine is like? Or did he become human to show us what being human is like? Did he become human to show us what being human is like? What does it mean to be human? These are some of the great philosophical questions of the day. And rightly so, I think, in this day of genetic engineering. What does it mean to be human? In this day of (laughs) titanium hips and knees and shoulders, what does it mean to be wholly human? To be fully human? Reading a book now by Peter Nowak called Human 3.0. Human 3.0. And it's about this interface between uh, between humanity and technology. Right? It's about the interface. It started out talking with pacemakers. 
I'm not going to ask who has one. But these ideas, uh, you know, we, and we have those, you know, those things that help us out. i got a pair on right here. Helping us out. Technology. Helping us out. Right? But we're, we're getting further and further into that now and starting to repurpose and reprogram ourselves. What does it mean to be human? To be human in a day where we have artificial intelligence in a, hum- in a day where, where uh, we, you know, we have, uh, you notice that, that cell phones have become a prosthesis? <laughs> what? It's attached to us. It's attached to us. And, and for some, for a certain generation, if they were to lay it there and walk over here, you'll notice, oh, might miss a message. Right? There is something about it. Already we find ourselves. I hear people talking about, oh, I drove all the way to Kingston and back and I didn't even have my phone. (laughs) What? What if I broke down? Like we have become, it's, it's something that now has become, you know, it's like another leg or something, right? We become so, what does it mean to be human? Jesus becomes human and his humanity, actually, this, this whole idea, but the illustration, I'm going to take an older one, go right back 2,000 years ago. Jesus illustrates for us what it is like to be human. It's incredible. What it's like to be human. You see, Jesus didn't come to start another religion. He didn't come and say, I want Christianity to be known in all the world. No, that's not what he said. That's not what he said. Jesus came because humanity had fallen short. Fallen short of a mark. As the Romans said, 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, not only did we miss the mark, this is, not, you know, this is an archery term, by the way, this falling, this, this idea of sin, that somehow we've missed the mark, right? But this is, this is really embarrassing. It's, it's not that we missed the mark, oh, you brought it too close, I went way over it. This is about, you didn't even get to the mark. Not only did you miss it, we came up short of it. It landed right there, and God's glory for us was way over there. What is God's glory for us? Newsflash, it is not to be God. Remember how that worked out in the Garden of Eden. They said, you know, the lie was, if you eat of this fruit, then you will become what? Like God. That wasn't God's intention for us. He didn't make us to be like God. He made us human, male and female. He made us. In His image, He made us. This is who we are to be, not to be God. What are we to be? Human. And what had happened? We fell short of God's glory. Not being God, being human is where we came short. Human is where we became. Paul carries on with this theme. In in, uh, uh, Romans chapter 5, he talks about, and he says, he talks about the first Adam. As in first Adam, we are all separated, all die. So in the second Adam, who's that? That's Christ. The second Adama, what Jesus says of himself, the human one. That's what Adam is called, man of earth, Adama. Adama. Jesus' second Adama. To show us what being human is like. What being human is like. You see, at Christmas, God comes to us in human form. We sing that, that beautiful chorus continue, always haunts me. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us. But then it says something even more outrageous, more blasphemous. Revealed in us. Reveal. Somehow that we can reveal, we can make known that which is eternal and of the divine. Oh, what a mystery. 
What a wonder. No wonder the angels sang joy to the world. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 talks about it like this. It says, now is the dwelling of God with man. And he will be their God. They will be his people. And he will reign with them. This is the, the revelation. You see, there was no more apocalyptic moment that when God comes into the world, now is the presence of God with man. This is not some great future event. This is now. And Jesus' promise is, I have come to you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You see, God is not out there somewhere. God is not up there or over there. God is the promised presence here and now. And we get to call ourselves children of God. Children of God, not a God far away, a God who has come to us. A God who each and every day desires that we come and recognize that He is to be birthed, not just to us, but Emmanuel revealed in us. Wow. To be human like that, God has come to us. What does being human mean? Look like we're told that uh, there's certain traits of, that make us human as separated from other animals in the world. One of them is speech. We have the gift of speech, and that can be challenged. Another one, we have an upright posture. Very few other creatures have an upright posture like this. I think we're exceptional. Don't we all think we're exceptional? <laughs> Another one, another one that, that, that somehow uh, being human, uh, and here, here it is, well, we have the opposable thumbs. I, like, I was listening to a comedian one time, he talked about, he said, we're told, he said, that, uh, that dolphins are almost as smart as humans. And like, like they could, you know, they think very complex thoughts. But uh, they said, oh, I had a picture of this beautiful painting. But they can't do anything about it because they have no thumbs, no hands. They can think it, but we have the opposable thumbs. Another thing that we're told that makes us human. This is something Charles Darwin actually called this. He said the most peculiar and the most human of all expressions. We blush. Donald doesn't blush. She's looking, yeah, he does. <laughs> He's blushing now. See, we told him. As soon as we point at if I was to point anybody out and we all focus, like, we get a little flush, don't we? Because we know, and, and like some people, some people go to the extreme. Some people blush for somebody else's sake. You know them? What? Oh, they're the heart feelers. They're the real feelers, those are. They get embarrassed for someone else. They're watching a movie and they've got to turn the channel for a while just because it's too embarrassing. <laughs> we blush. No other creature blushes. You see, being, being flushed, like, it's, it's not just about those little comedic times when we make someone blush. It talks of something deeper. You see, the first ones are about... a physiological thing like speech and thumbs and standing upright. This one is about an emotional contact. This one is about a psychological contact. This one speaks to something so deep that we don't even have all the words for it. Because it talks about how we can feel empathy one for another. How we can have compassion one for another. How can we, we can feel somebody else's pain. Somebody else's embarrassment. We never would want that for them or for us. To do unto others as you would have them do unto you. See, that's where we become human. That's one of the things, and as Darwin says, it's one of the things that is you know, the most odd thing. It's the most human thing. A most human thing. To blush. To feel for somebody. To have that depth of feeling. The ability to feel compassion, to show compassion. What does the old hymn says? Except I am moved 
with compassion? How dwelleth thy spirit in me? Can't dwell in us. Joan Osborne, what if God were one of us? She has this uh, uh, one line, uh, one of the verse opens, uh, uh, if God had a name, what would it be? If this God had a name, what would it be? And oh, we can quote the Hebrew and the Greek of all the names of God. If God had a name, if God who is present with us today, if He is that stranger on the bus, if He had a name, what would it be? I remember a story about a, a, a downtown mission and, and ministering to people who on rough side of life all the, all the steps didn't fall in pleasant places. There was one gentleman who used to come to the mission pretty often. His name was Joe. And Joe came to a great realization, a great embrace of God's love. He received it for himself. But Joe was still a homeless man. And he lived on the street and he ministered and he spoke with people there. He would sit with people. He would care for people. One night the, the altar call was given again and another soul came and knelt at the altar. And he's there praying and the pastor can hear his prayer. And he's praying, oh God, make me like Joe. Make me like Joe. And the pastor, after a while, he goes down and he kneels beside him and he says, don't you mean make me like Jesus? And the man looks at him and he says, why, sir? Is he like Joe? Is he like, if God had a name, what would it be? Have we had the privilege to be God in someone's life? To speak words of life to them? To sit with them in moments where they need compassion and comfort and healing? To speak the words and you become what? God with flesh on. God revealed in us. Revealed in us, what does being human look like? The scripture tells us that Christ, that in Christ, there is no Greek or Jew, no slave nor free, no male nor female. And you know something? We have so cordoned this thing up that we think this is the church crowd. That's for the church crowd. That's for the church crowd to stand in the church and to look out and say, in Christ Jesus, there is no Greek or Jew. There is no male or female. There is no bound or free. All are one in Christ. And to go with that message to the ones who need to know that God has come for them. Emmanuel presenced himself right here and said, you are mine. You are mine. It's for those, it's to, so that it can be ministered through the church. That when we are in Christ, we see the world as Christ saw it. We see the person as Christ saw them. Not with a label over their head, but with a heart that needed to know of God's grace to them. That's how we see each other. That's the great gift of being human. Being Human. Christ says a very disturbing thing. What would God look like if God, if He had a face? Another line of Osborne's song. What would it look like? Jesus says, Foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. That's what the human one looks like. And in as much as we have done it to that one, we have done it to Christ himself. What does it mean to be human? For God to become incarnate. This Homeless Christ. We even heard it in our reading today. In, in, in that thinking that God has come and there was no place for Him. He came to that which was His own. They would not receive Him. We go all historical. 
on that. You say, oh, that was the Jews. What about today? Because God comes every day to us, his own. Let us receive him. You see, because in Christ there is no gender, no color, no creed, no financial status, no place of birth better than another, no learning ability better than another. For in Christ none will be rejected. None will go to the back of the line or to the back of the bus or to the back of the church or to the back of town. Why? Because the church is to gather these people together as the family of God. Not to see ourselves different, but to see ourselves as completely and fully human. We quote it in our doctrine, don't we? That in the person of Jesus Christ, the divine and human natures are united so that He is truly and properly God and truly and properly God. Man, if Jesus is 100% human and we're not like him, what are we? We are to become human, fully human, to see each other as God sees us. Christ is coming this Advent season in anticipation of a Christ who comes into the world. It is illustrative of what it means to become human. Are we like him? You see, the Advent is not a memorial to something, an an illustration that happened nearly 2,000 years ago. No. It is not a historical event. This Christmas is a current event. This coming of Emmanuel is a current event and it is always illustrative of a God who loves His world so much that He comes as the child so that we might learn from Him. Yes, learn what God is like, but also learn what it means To be human, fully human, and to receive each other as God himself has received us. So you see, in Christ, we have everything we need, not to be God, to be human. To stand with the one who everyone else stands away from. To plead the cause of the one who nobody else would raise a word in their defense. To stand with the guilty ones. For they too are made in God's image. They too are made in God's image. This Christmas season is the great collision again of that which is divine becoming human, that which is eternal becoming fixed in time and space, and that which is God coming and being revealed again, Emmanuel, God with us, revealed in us. Let us pray. Father, we pause before you this day, recognizing again, Father, that your heart is towards your people. You continue to give us opportunity. You continue to give us the promised presence to walk out into your world, the world that you love so much, and to allow ourselves to be vulnerable there, to be truly human there. We thank you that we have such a model of this humanity in Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, 
he humbled himself. Father, this Christmas season, grant us opportunities, continued opportunities, Father, to minister grace to one another. Father, to wish, Father, a wonderful Christ Mass to each and every one. And Father, as we share this time as fellowship of faith, as community, as the larger community of the church, Father, as we share this season as your world, Father, we ask that indeed your presence might be made known. For you have indeed come to us. And you have indeed remained with us. And your promise is you won't leave us. And you won't forsake us. May we walk out in the courage of that promised presence to be human one to another. In Christ's name we ask these mercies. Amen. Just in reflection this morning, I want us to take time, if we could, to sing a beautiful chorus. Again, one that focuses, focuses our attention, lifts our eyes again. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us. Blessed Redeemer, living word. Let's sing together. standing for our closing song and our closing song for today as with gladness men of old did the guiding star behold as with joy they hailed its light leading onward beaming bright so most gracious lord may we evermore be led to thee we'll sing verses one and two together Thank you. 
our Heavenly Father, we pray as we go from this place today that we will go with your grace, with your mercy, living, being living examples for you, living lights in this world. We pray in your name. Amen. The last verse, the fifth verse together before we sing the benediction. Amen.